I love Walt Whitman because I think he's so life affirming and it's just it's that type of affirmation that I wish most people could feel. In preparing for the sermon, I've read many statistics, some contradictory, some confusing, all interpreted to support some bias, with one side calling the other side liar or worse. I think it was Mark Twain who said, there are lies, damn lies, and then there are statistics. (laughs) And though I will throw out some statistics here and there, I want mainly to talk about ideas. And first, the idea of addiction, a very real difficulty that we cannot minimize. Some people take some substance that disrupt their whole lives and sometimes even kill them. The most common by far are tobacco and alcohol. Less common are marijuana, cocaine, heroin, ecstasy, as well as commonly prescribed medications such as Xanax and amphetamines. Some people, after taking some of these substances, have difficulty stopping. The first drink an alcoholic takes is an act of free will, but is the second, or the third, or the twelfth? In a free society, we tend to let people do what they want unless they are harmed to themselves or others. And so it's clear we should intervene when somebody uses drugs and their drug use puts others in danger, the drunk driver, the person who's stealing to support their heroin habit. But what about the person who is harming themselves? The single drunk at home may be shortening his own life, but are they harming anyone else? And if I make $100,000 a year and spend $20,000 on cocaine, there is less impact on society if I have the same habit but only a $10,000 income. Sometimes it's not the habit itself, but all the dysfunction that surrounds the habit. One of the problems talking about drug use is there's a tendency to divide people into different camps. Legal drug users, illegal drug users, drug abusers, teetotalers, social drinkers. And we imagine these people as wholly different from ourselves when really it's more a matter of degree. Why does a person start taking drugs? Generally to fix something, to cause change. Whether it's sinus medicine to stop a runny nose or insulin to regulate diabetes, cocaine to get excited, a cigarette to relax, a drink to loosen up, coffee to wake up, St. John's wort to elevate your mood, love potion number nine to make you feel romantic, mother's little helper to calm yourself, or Ritalin to calm your child. All of these work to varying degrees with a varying degree of side effects. The advantage of most of these is that they work pretty quickly because we often desire a quick remedy. A drug is easier than prevention or a lifestyle change. If we went to sleep earlier, we would not need caffeine in the morning. A proper diet reduces the risk of high blood pressure, diabetes, heart attack, and high cholesterol. When drugs are prescribed to help these ailments, I know doctors talk and recommend a diet change that goes with it, but I know I've also met lots of people who say, great, I got my cholesterol pill, I can eat anything I want now. (laughs) Gets reduced to take a pill to cure my ill. 
Alcohol may help you socialize by making you oblivious to your insecurities, but relationships are deeper when you risk that vulnerability while fully aware. An antidepressant may help you not feel sad after a loss, but may also rob you of the necessary grief process. The quickest solution is not always the best long-term solution. A teen with few friends can quickly remedy the problem by holding a keg party while her parents are out of town. But the results will be short-lived and potentially disastrous. People do not take drugs believing that they will lose something. They expect to gain something, and they often do, at first. But for some people, the drug takes over. Social drinkers begin not to care that their social circle wants them to stop. I have had withdrawal headaches from a lack of coffee, and at which point I have to decide whether to feed my body's craving or go to caffeinated. One time I found Excedrin helped my headaches and realized that it contained caffeine. <laughs> I had just changed my drug delivery system. <laughs> at the point of increased tolerance for a drug or at the point of withdrawal, it becomes a little harder to talk about free will and whether a person is good or bad and and the statement in Joy's concerns about unconditional love rather than judgment is certainly going to be what helps people out more. There's a chemically based compulsion. There are some people who cannot drink responsibly and some who can. But at what point do we hold those who cannot use the substance responsibly, accountable. Also, it depends on the substance. I've read about a few people who can function while taking heroin daily, even more on methadone, but can we ever talk about a responsible narcotic user? One of the most clear ways to find out if you are addicted is if you keep using a drug even when it's killing you. And there's over 400,000 deaths per year attributable to cigarettes, 100,000 to alcohol, 15,000 due to drug overdoses, both legal and illegal. And surprisingly, as few as zero attributed to marijuana as a sole cause. But see, smoking kills after 30 or so years, so it kind of a reverse of our paradigm of instant gratification. It, it's a legal drug because it really doesn't cause instant harm. Alcohol can cause instant poisoning at frat parties where they try to see who can drink the most. But its most likely killing effect is through accidents. And those who do live long enough do eventually get heart disease and liver failure. But heroin, cocaine, and prescription meds that are abused bring the most alarm because their death from overdose is immediate and instantaneous. But even if someone is not killing themselves with a drug, when do we have the right to interfere? When can a person's right to self-determination be overruled? If a person is addicted, can we say that they really have a choice in the matter that we're overruling? We do stop suicides when we can, but does society have a mandate to stop the slow suicide of people taking drugs? When we know that some will survive, especially with things like alcohol, and they have very little effect in their lives, but where others will be devastated. 
We all have reasons for our own use. Whatever we're taking, we believe is safer than what other people take. But then there is a flip where people don't excuse the use of others. And I think the sense of drug use conceived as a thing of punishing others, the role of punishment really only works if you perceive that it's happening to someone else. And much of the U.S. drug law was enacted on the basis of racism. Opium was said to be used by the Chinese to lure white women into opium dens. And cocaine was said to make black violence, blacks violent. And, and so it's no surprise now that the laws are disproportionately enforced when they were specifically written to perceive racial problems. Though drug use is similar across the races, it has been more convenient to scapegoat drug use as the source of racial inequity rather than the focus on racism itself. And even when alcohol was prohibited, the problem was associated with the most recent immigrants, the Italians with wine, the Germans with beer, the Irish with whiskey. And I don't know all of you were able to say those words before I said them, because those stereotypes are so deep. Even though there are some of us who aren't Italian who have drank wine, some of us who are not Irish who have drank whiskey, and some of us who are not German who have drank beer. I think the logic of the drug war follows the overriding logic of our society for the need of instant gratification. If you lock somebody up, you stop them, at least temporarily, if you've worked in America's prisons, you know differently from taking the drug, <laughs> and you got that one person off the street. It's a feel-good, instant gratification approach. And if the person is perceived as other, you don't have to deal with them anymore. Wealthy, mostly white users have insurance and can get treatment. Poor, mostly minority users are denied treatment and given prison. The get trough on drug user solution seems to be just as deceiving as drug use itself. It appears to be fixing a problem, but really it's not. It's been a way of blaming the victim of racial oppression for their own plight. It's easier to blame others for bringing drug use, such as foreigners who sell this stuff, or to minorities who, who peddle it, and ignore the majority of us who use it. It's more difficult to look at the demand side. In short, ourselves. According to the 1999 National Household Survey on Drugs, 87.7 million Americans aged 12 or over have admitted the use of an illegal drug at least once. Think of your lifetime. Has there been any offense that you've had that you could be spending 5 to 15 years in prison for right now? And that's just illegal drugs. The rates for alcohol, of course, are even higher. What is it? about our society that creates so many people who feel a need for escape.
The solution is not going to be easy. Legalizing drugs is not going to be a magic bullet because it's still going to have to deal with the people who have addictions. And if anybody's worked on their own addiction or have, been, have loved someone else, it's a day-by-day -day thing. It's not something where you get the magic bullet and it's fixed. Because when someone stops taking the drug, the problem that they were trying to fix sometimes still is there. Even if that problem was just boredom and wanting to try something else to make their life exciting. The things that we need to do to make our lives exciting and connected to other people don't happen in short-term solutions. The party, finding that perfect lover for that perfect night, We need to look and realize that this problem will be with us forever. But what we can change is how we react to the people who have problems with addiction. They are more likely to be helped through treatment. The National Treatment Improvement Evaluation Study stated that treatment appears to be the most cost effective, particularly when compared to incarceration, which is often the alternative. Treatment costs range from a low to 1800 per client to a high of $6,800 hundred dollars per client. In contrast, the cost of incarceration in 93 was 23,406 per inmate per year. But it's not money that we're trying to save. A war implies that we have enemies that we must destroy. But we are our own worst enemies, someone we love. And if we go out to destroy ourselves or our loved ones, this war will destroy us. There needs to be a paradigm shift from war to healing. From all walks of life, from our medicine, Legitimate medicine should promote prevention of, and wellness before pharmaceutical panaceas. Our lives need to shift rather than toiling and trying to find in this evening that I got off, how can I instantly create joy? through a pill, through alcohol, through smoking some marijuana, it will make you giggle. We need to reorient our lives so that there is a sustained preparation for joy. That we, every moment we are working, not looking for instant gratification, but building the things in our lives that give us the freedom to truly enjoy and not just make fleeting grasp at joy. There is no love, potion number nine. And mother's little helper, better be a person rather than a pill. Amen. Have a little time for discussion but there will be more discussion available in the library at 12, so after you get your thing. So a few comments now, if you can come up to the mic, and then hold, if the line gets too long, realize you'll have more opportunity later. <laughs>